Hi, welcome to the Economic Circle. This is Dr. Alex Mosley, the founder. Now, who wants more money in life? Of course, we all do. But as economists, we need to think a little bit deeper about money and also for our own wealth prospects. If you don't understand the history of money and if you don't understand what these paper notes could be worth or be worth less, then you haven't got a clue what you're doing either in economics or in life. So this short tutorial is just going to review the history of money before we look at other tutorials, which will be in the series. Have a look for those later on what is currency depreciation, what are currency regimes, what would happen if the Greeks leave the euro, uh, what is the euro all about, what's a gold exchange rate, what's the Bretton Woods system, etc, etc. We need to know a little bit about the history of money. Now, as trade and commerce expanded in early human history, indirect exchange replaced direct exchange. Now, direct exchange is what we normally call barter. Now, indirect exchange uses commodities that traders do not consume or use in the production process, but instead accept as media something in between them to assist the trade. Now, barter, as you know from basic economics or common sense, involves the problem that folk have to find what each other needs, while using money obviates the whole issue. So I exchange my sheep for some silver, let's say, and then use the silver to purchase some spears. Now, people who don't study economics, who are very naive or don't think too much deeply about political philosophy or economics, often assume, oh, wouldn't the world be a better place if we just had barter? Right, OK, so next time I'm at the gas station or the petrol station, whatever you want to call it, I'll pop in and say, uh, I've just filled up my tank. Uh, it says £74 on the, uh, on the earth till, but... Um, how about two and a half hours of economics instead? I'll tutor you right now. It's not going to go down too well, is it? So monetary media or money obviates the need to find people whose wants are the same as what we want to give them. In other words, the problem with the double, double, double coincidence of wants. That's hard to say, double, double. Right. Now, early monies were well, whatever the local community created or evolved. So cowrie shells that were used in India and Africa, for example, rice in Japan, tobacco, cattle, things that were basically divisible, you could divide them up, and cattle not very good at this, portable, you could carry them to market, and which maintained a high exchange value. Now, as communities using different commodities began exchanging, there would be a mutually beneficial convergence onto a better form of money, as seen by the traders. Now, gradually in the history of humanity, gold and silver became universally accepted. They beat things like carry shells and rice, etc. And let's face it, cows are not very portable or divisible. They can be held as wealth, such as today's tractors or property or land or art could be used as wealth, but not very good as monetary media. So if somebody comes along wanting to exchange some cows for something, Money such as silver and gold is going to replace it pretty quickly, and this is what we see in the history of um, the history of humanity and gold. Now, I was just wondering there what Carpe Diem sees the day was doing on the top there, because the image is by Tony Fisher. I think it's uh, looks like an American, possibly or German, don't know. Uh, farming in the background, but Carpe Diem sees the day with the cows. I don't know what you're supposed to do there. Anyway. Often people believed, and still believe, that a state is needed to invent money. We often read this in basic history books and, again, in higher-level political philosophy books by those political philosophers who've never studied economics. How can you do political philosophy without economics? Good question, right? The state invented money, they assume, and gave it value. But this is not at all necessary, as money is used first and foremost in exchange. Traders use it first. And it is they, it is the marketplace, traders, you and I go to buy things, haggle, exchange, etc., sell things, that decide the value and usefulness of the monetary, of the money and the monetary commodity used. So therefore, money was never invented as such. It has always emerged, it has evolved, where ha there has been trade. States just run on the back of the market system. They're, in effect parasites on market activity. Now, to what extent it should be a parasite or not is what political philosophy is about, right? Um, personally, I don't like parasites. I want them to be as small as possible. Thank you very much. Now, substitutes. 
Taking gold and silver to the market or between markets always carried and carries a risk of highway robbery and loss. So in complex trading societies, traders converged onto using substitutes to carry with them. Effectively, these were early checkbooks or notes that represented the value of their currency holdings. Now, of course, there had to be a great deal of trust to ensure that the substitute stood for what the trader said it stood for. So bankers and guarantors emerged once again in the market to give credence to the substitute's value. So if you imagine a young teenager going into the marketplace with this note, if he wrote his own name on it, the traders would just laugh and say, sorry, Sonny, I don't think your money's worth anything. But if it had his father or his mother's status and they, they were well known in the marketplace as a great guarantor, then the money, that substitute, would exchange for money quite readily. Anybody cheating, and there's always a great incentive for the crooks in our world to cheat, would result in a loss of trust for the trader and for the producer of the substitutes. So if somebody's handing out just fake money, it would bounce back. If you try to cheat the world, the world comes back at you at some point. You can't get away with it for too long, right? So trust the colour of the money. In effect, the market creates, <coughs> I should say, they're not just created, but continues to create systems <clears throat> excuse me, of monetary exchange that support trust. And they penalise traders and bankers who cheat. And this is still the case today. It's a principle of markets that a lot of politicians can't get their head around because they think they're the ones that we as traders and people out there, citizens, civilians, should trust. Well, if you trust government, you believe... <laughs> <laughs> Just look, read your history. First principle of political philosophy, do not trust governments. Simple, right. Now, traders could often say that their word is their bond. Trust me, I'm a trader. But no, we don't trust anybody else but ourselves, ultimately. The market, i.e. everyone else, prefers to see the colour of the money. In other words, the gold or the silver that their checks and notes promised. And if that wasn't forthcoming trust was gone. So therefore, trust is absolutely critical with money. Now, we've handed over to governments over the last um, uh, few centuries. And as I said, first principle of political philosophy is don't trust government, for goodness sake. If you trust government, you're going to lose your wealth, you'll lose your rights, for goodness sake. Just, just read your history if you're not sure why, if you're a bit naive in that regard, okay? Go pick up some history books and see what governments get up to. So, we've handed our trust over to governments, and there's going to be repercussions for that, of course. But when you're a trader in the marketplace, if people can't trust what you're bringing, i.e. your checkbook or the notes that you're pulling out of your pocket, there's no trade, right? Okay. Fiduciary media, uh, it's a fancy Latin terms here. Media just means things that circulate fiduciary on trust. Now, as change becomes more complex, it's not surprising that fiduciary media or monetary substitutes circulate more than the actual physical money of gold and silver because it's heavy. Yes, it's portable, but it's heavy. It clunks in your pocket and you're a target for theft, of course. So the ease with which traders can exchange through the fiduciary media, that is media taken on trust, simplifies and reduces the cost of transactions. And arguably, traders are keen to reduce the cost of a transaction. They want to transact X product for Y product or service, right? Now, the money bit is just the smoothing out of barter, remember. So you want to smooth it out, and then you want to reduce the costs of it. So electronic exchanges today, where I can just swipe my card, put in my PIN, um, or, or even just swipe it over the machine for under £10, is, makes trade a lot quicker, a lot easier. And that's what I want to have. As traders, we don't want to spend too much time actually engaged in haggling over the value of the currency, whether it's worth it, whether there's trust behind it, whether there's a guarantor. We just want the transaction to be completed, move on, right? Simplify, reduce the cost of transaction. However, an unfortunate tendency has always been, since the ancient Egyptians, to cheat the systems. Banks, the institutions creating monetary substitutes for their clients, have always faced a tempting incentive to produce more substitutes than the gold and silver they stored. Let's read that again. They've always faced the tempting incentive to produce more substitutes than the gold and silver that they store. This is because not all the holders of the substitutes would claim them at the same time. Okay, quick analogy. What does that mean? Imagine you are a car dealer, 
and you've got a say 50 cars on your lot on your garage car park etc that you're selling but online you're selling a hundred well, it's a problem here, isn't it? You don't have 100 to sell. You've only got 50. So if 100 customers come and claim the cars they've just bought off you online and you've only got 50, you go to jail, mate. Now, banks have done this since ancient Egyptian times and typically have got into trouble for it. Until recently. Now, fractional reserve banking, another fancy word to learn. Economists split on whether this action by the banks creating more monetary substitutes than they have reserves is viable or moral, or economically useful. Now, those who think it's useful support what we call fractional reserve banking. In other words, you only need a few cars on the lot to sell more than what you've got. Huh? Doesn't make sense. Right, let's go back to banks. Right, you've got a hundred pounds of gold coins in the bank, and you're going to lend out a thousand. Huh? Right, there are opponents. The opponents prefer a hundred percent reserve banking. You've got 50 cars on the lot, you can sell 50. You've got £100 worth of gold coins in the bank vault. You can lend out, given permission by the depositors, you can lend out that 100 right? Or we just keep it there on deposit. That's another big issue to get involved with. What's the difference between investment banking and deposit banking, right? Now, this issue of fractional reserve banking is rarely considered or discussed or even noted when we come to look at domestic inflation problems or currency regimes or monetary crises or sovereign debt crises, nobody looks at it. Seriously, all the economics articles I read through, there's only a few people who put up their hand, uh, like I used to, and say, uh, excuse me, if you print more fiduciary media, I substitute them, we've got in reserve, surely you're creating a problem. And this is some of the economics we'll be looking at in other tutorials. Now, banks that produce more substitutes than reserves would if traders find, as well as found them out, be subject to a bank run. Now, throughout history, states have usually supported a policy of punishing, even killing such bankers, castrating them on grounds of fraud and deception. Castrating? Henry I, I think, did it to a few minters who were cheating, right? <laughs> Later, kings thought, this is a good idea, you know, maybe we should try it, get away with it, or make it legally mandatory for people to accept our debased coins. <laughs> right? However, as I've just said, states then found out that if they controlled the banking system, they could produce as much monetary substitutes as they like. They have typically nationalised the mints, allowing the kings and presidents to debase the gold and silver coins, <laughs> and to print monies to cover their debts. Uh, sire, we've run out of money. Oh, never mind, just print a few more off. Um, there was a great exchange, I remember this on um, the, the TV quite a few years ago, when Boris Yeltsin was in power in Russia. President, Premier, whatever he called him, called himself. And uh, some the newspaper reporter said to him, uh, Mr Yeltsin, the Russian government cannot pay for all its soldiers and doctors and education people. What are you going to do about it? He says, print money, of course. Very honest. In the Federal Reserve Bank, you'd get a very complicated Orwellian speak, which basically reduces down to, ah, uh, we'll print some money. Right? Now, backed by the invention of a central bank in 1694 with the Bank of England, the system could then be used to fund state expenditures. You need to know this, guys. If you don't know where money's coming from these days, you're going to have problems, right, in economics and for your own wealth. Because later, in the 20th century, the state then took over running the economy and used the central bank, using Keynesian economics and monetarist economics later, and the banking system to fund its expenditures and deficits. The state loves central banks because it can print money, loves the fractional reserve banking system because that can create money out of thin air, to help fund taxes and trying to manipulate the economy. This is what macroeconomics often revolves around without anybody saying there's an elephant in the room called fractional reserve banking or fake money. Interesting, eh? Wonder why? Lots of arguments about that. As I said, some economists say this is viable. Don't worry about it. It's okay to have fractional reserve banking. Others, like myself, you can probably gather from my humour, um, prefer the 100% reserve banking system. Uh, so did Milton Friedman. Anyway, there are serious implications for messing with money. When it expands, either through the digging up of new gold or the printing of money or the creation of fiduciary media, it creates an inflationary effect. Prices rise, holding other things constant. 
We economists always have to throw that in because you never know what else is going on in the world. So all things being constant, ceteris paribus, for those who've done a bit of Latin, means that prices will rise when you increase the money supply. The greater the expansion of the money supply, the greater pressure on prices to rise. Now, implication. When prices rise, when we have a period of inflation, some people will profit, but many will lose wealth. Let's have a quick review. German hyperinflation. This is the cost of what one gold mark exchanged for in terms of the paper marks going from 1918, just after coming to the yeah, end of the war there, 1918, 1919, First World War this is, and there was a little bit of inflation coming through the system, and then because they were printing money hand over fist, they denied it, of course. can't remember the name of the German banker, but he denied it. That was not us. Prices started shooting up as people started trying to spend all those paper notes, and they didn't believe that uh, prices would continue rising. A lot of people lost a lot of wealth, and historians often relate this as to why Adolf Hitler came to power, why there was such extremist politics uh, in Germany. Um, it also... Um, happened in Italy, of course, without the hyperinflation. So there's other reasons going on. Nonetheless, look at that. Um, one mark exchange for 100,000 pieces of paper, <laughs> Reichsmarks, in uh, July 23. By November, it was exchanging for a billion or a trillion if you're American. Right? So that's uh, 1 times 10 to the 12. Whoa! Scary. Right. But we as economists, as thinking people, can't understand how inflation works unless we understand what is money. And to understand money, we always need to check its history. Money such as the pound or the euro today or the dollar gains its value from the trust that traders have given and continue to give the currency. That trust historically can go back a long way. Now, if traders lose trust in a currency, they will drop it in favour of something holding better value. So they may rush out of the euro into the dollar, or out of the dollar into the yuan, or out of the yuan and into gold or something. So it can be an alternative currency, or often it is gold or silver when all the currencies are in turmoil and people don't know where the safe haven is. The safe haven for international currency traders and for many people around the world is gold or silver. We know that is universal money still. Underneath all the paper systems, Gold and silver remain money. Uh, a story I often tell uh, my students is that if you're sending reconnaissance troops or special forces behind the lines, you don't send them with dollars or yen or euros or RMB or anything like this. You send them with gold. Gold buys food, shelter, right? People will smile as gold comes out of your pocket. Present some euros. Uh, no, I think we'll call the local soldiers to come and get rid of you. Gold, hello, do come in. Now, what's this also about? The economiccircle.com. If you're a beginner student or an intermediate economist um, struggling in some courses or want to learn more, check out the Economic Circle. This is my online textbook. So if you're doing the A-level or 101, the course covers most of the critical issues that students need to understand. It's over 120 videos. I walk you through the key concepts with diagrams and pictures and energy. I offer deeper analysis for students seeking higher grades. Well, of course, that's all of you with a little bit of humor and insights into how economics can also improve your wealth prospects as well as your professional prospects. I'm not averse to connecting the textbook to the real world because I see how it applies all the time. I'm a philosopher, I'm an economist by training, and I love looking at how our ideas, economic, philosophical, political, etc., relate to the real world. So take a look at theeconomiccircle.com and see how I can help you gain better grades. Otherwise, if you're not doing a course in economics, I hope you enjoyed the video. Comments welcome below, of course. Um, keep the language calm. We do have miners reading it. And uh, let's not get into conspiracy theories. Let's just stick to the economics and a rational, humane, civilized discussion. Okay, thanks guys, and see you in another unit. Bye.